Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Wilson, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name's Eric Wilson. I'm, I'm not Eric G. Wilson, <laughs> the guy who wrote Everyone lo- Loves to Watch a Train Wreck. And I'm not Eric Wilson, who works for the New York Times. I'm Eric M. Wilson. And actually, we get each other's email all the time, so it's no big deal. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually a retired law professor and criminologist. I was at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia for more than 20 years. Uh, I had to take early retirement because of health reasons. And then um, I've just been continuing working on things on my own as an independent online researcher. I just got a 300,000 word plus book on James Elroy and the LA Quartet and uh, America USA Underworld Trilogy coming out uh, early this year. Now that it's 2023. I've been working on that solid for the last 18 months. And now I'm just getting together my next two books I'm working on. One is a collection of my law, literature, and cinema essays that I used to teach when I was um, an, an undergraduate instructor, and also a book on the Caribbean crime novel and the relationship between organized crime and political conspiracy within the Caribbean. So let's let's talk a little bit about organized crime and political conspiracy type stuff. I, through my recent conversations, and especially the addiction I have with the JFK topic, because it is so fascinating, it's mostly just because I started learning about things like the relationship with organized crime, and I started kind of noticing a lot of covert capabilities, which kind of had me dive more into the intelligence communities and what was going on. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm assuming you read you read my book here. Yeah. I, okay, that's why I punked him too. Yeah, it had JFK in the title. I was like, "Look, we got to talk at some point about JFK." So, my well, goal. somebody, somebody on Pin Interest actually started a homepage on this book, and there are like hundreds of photos taken from all over the world: Angola, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, <laughs> uh, of the uh, the so called hobos they were pulling in on that on Dallas on the day. Oh, tra- the tramps may or may not have been one of those guys. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's great. Um, yeah. Um, First of all, we were talking before the show, so we were talking a little bit about conspiracy and why it's become a bad word for so many different reasons, which is actually the uh, interesting podcast in itself. The ups and downs, the fluctuations of the legitimacy of the concept and the language of conspira- conspiracy and conspiracism. But I think just to make a rather kind of banal criminological point before we get into it a little further, if anyone ever doubts that there are such a things as conspiracies, the standard comeback that I always use is organized crime. Because every org action that constitutes legally a form of organized crime is by definition conspiratorial. You have a number of people engaging in extra or illegal activities to bring about an, an objective that is not warranted by legitimate channels of power. That's a conspiracy. The problem with that, of course, is, is that although that's factually true, it, leaves everybody numb because that's not what they mean by conspiracy what they mean by conspiracy is getting into the domains of a cult or occluded government the secret cabal the deep state underground military installations and stuff like that um so that the fact that we engage that the politics conspiracy is as as ancient as the greeks and the romans is established because when we go through a lot of the roman and greek histories they themselves wrote about themselves Conspiracy and the fear of conspiracy and the need and the threat of conspiracy are mainstream topics. Right? There's there's no question about that. The problem is is that when we're dealing with a high tech, diversified, um, almost like polymorphous type of state, so much. Well, let me put the, let me put it this way: We've so convinced ourselves that we've attained universal transparency through media that the notion that there's anything taking place that is of serious import outside the gaze of the media becomes counterintuitive. And thereby, and that's one reason why we throw up psychological defense barriers against accepting the notion. We're almost talking about something that's unreal by definition, precisely because it is not transparent. Now that's an epistemological assumption. 
it's by no means the case that just because something is not being recorded, it does not take place. And if we look at the practices of many covert agencies, one of the things they do is they don't make sure they do not leave any records of any kind. Off the book operations are as common in the CIA as they are in any organized crime operation. It's called Blue Skies Memo, which was uh, coined during the 9-11 thing. Um, it was uh, about C is everything, or if you're going to give a report about a mission or something, give it to an operative, but make sure it's just from your lips and it's not written down. So everything appears that if the skies are blue, you know, that nothing, nothing's going on. It's interesting to me because, I mean, before we even started this conversation, I was looking through the CIA website, which they have some pretty good stuff on there, um, surprisingly. But there was a lot of articles that were being written, and it was one from James Jesus or James Jesus Angleton. I Angleton, yeah. 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 So he was stating about the intelligence community, and he says – the reason why there's this era of secrecy is because what the Americans don't understand is the way that we have to do business. And it was quoted in that magazine. And I go, well, this is what I was talking about with the fact that Americans, as much as I blame the intelligence community for not giving transparency on a lot of things, I blame the American public as well, too, because we have been so disconnected from what is actually going on with our government, whether it's I understand people have a life, people have a job, people have things that do. But it's so shocking when something gets brought up, like some people know about COINTEL. Pro, but did you know that they created a fake coloring book and gave it to white donors that were donating to the Black Panther Party? And a lot of people go, that sounds conspiracy. I was like, it's that word that gets brought up. And I was like, it happens. It gets lumped in with flat earth and you can't do that. And when you see a main CIA director talking about um, this idea of why the intelligence agencies and what the things that they do, Americans won't understand is because they're aware that they've been doing a lot of things that are seen because every country does these types of opera. It's not just us. And I think explaining that helps people understand a little bit more about this level of conspiracy and how far we go. It's the idea of transparency. Will that will we accept that? Yeah, and the other thing too that, that ties into that, which you just kind of touched on the very end there, is the notion of American exceptionalism. Is if you go back through the history of American political culture, uh, all the way back to the, the original Puritan, the Puritan establishment um, in the 17th century, or late, yeah, 17th century, I'd like to say the 17th century. I will go with the 17th century. You know, things happened before then, but with the, the main, with the establishment of the Puritan colony in, uh, in, um, by, the, by the British, there's always been an understanding that not only are, is America or what became America exceptional because of its special relationship with God, which is a symptom of the puritanical notion of grace, which is often is talked about, but also because we're separate from the decadent Europeans. In other words, conspiracy is something that the French, German, Russian types <laughs> do because of their lack of freedom, their history of tyranny, their history of absolutism, the history of extremism, fanaticism, blah, blah, blah. That kind of, and of course, and then, and then we move to the Middle East and then China and Japan is the same thing. Anything that's sort of not American is somehow unwholesome because it is not under within the, the historical continuum of liberty, democracy, and freedom, individualism. Therefore, when you say that the territorial elements of the American government, you're almost sort of engaging in a kind of an anti or an un-Americanism by thinking in those terms. You're sort of defecting from uh, the almost kind of totalitarian assumption of the of the liberal democratic consensus, which is it becomes an, uh, a signifier of our national and collective identity. It sounds so much like libertarianism, but because I would have been a libertarian and I was and I thought I was for a very long time. And honestly, I don't believe in any I say agnostic on the whole political sides of things. I'd rather just believe, hey, it's a deep state. And then people laugh at me. I'm like, that's fine. It's let's just let's just go with that. And the reason why I do that is the only time a conspiracy or something deep like what we talk about when it comes to deep state power ever gets mentioned is if it's blamed on a, po a certain political side. It's the only reason these media outlets ever do anything like that. But if you talk about the media being captured. People will be like, oh, that's like the stereotype out there. They don't report real news anyway. I'm like, well, no. Did you know about Operation Mockingbird? And did you know that it said it only lasts three months on the history book things? And if you look through the 2022 release of JFK documents, 1964, 1965, 1966, I found documents saying get your media assets to cover this story in this particular way. And I go, I don't know about you, but my math, I'm pretty sure that's like that's more than three months. I mean, that's like three years or 
it's probably still happening today. But then, I mean, they even kept that list out of the 13, 14, 15, 16 people at all these magazine editors and all these companies that were in charge of going with the official story. We're getting payoffs from CIA agents. Whenever you say that, people will roll their eyes. But if you have the documents to back them up, I just don't like this idea of the way we can only talk about things as if it gets blamed on a certain political leaning. And I think people got to see a little bit more past that. It's before, long before, like Tucker Carlson was on air. It's long before Anderson Cooper was on air. It This has been going on for generations. One of the things um, I am I follow, uh, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald and uh, Matt Tabby a great deal. Uh, they're the only two journalists I pay the slightest bit of attention to, or take in the slightest degree seriously today. And one of the things that they both noted, and I think they're right about this, is that it's interesting, especially after the <laughs> the political trauma of 2016, that the positions between right and left have sort of shifted a little bit. Uh, in that today, liberals tend to love the FBI and the CIA, whereas conservatives tend to be much more suspicious of them. And of course, one of the reasons for that they speculate is that the FBI and the CIA are interpreted rightly or wrongly. I mean, really, I'm just simply saying what the fact is, as opposed to the truth of it, or the social fact, as opposed to the actual fact, is that there seemed to be kind of a resistance to Donald Trump, MAGA, and the assumed collusion between the, 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 the extremist Republican branch of the party, the extremist branch of the Republican Party, and let's say the Russia, the whole um steel dossier russia gate um conundrum actually fiasco really when you just stop and think about it and that conservatives of course are feeling more persecuted by the fbi and the cia because they feel that they're being uh and of course the twitter file debacle as well that just happened a couple about a month ago or so are indicating that there is a perceived bias in institutional power social media and national security against the right as opposed to what we call the left. And I think that's one, it's interesting that the way where this two sides kind of switch positions on this, that currently the standing of the CIA and the FBI among voters who identify as liberal is statistically much higher than voters who identify as conservative or libertarian. I didn't know that. See, if you would ask me, I would have said like, because a lot of the JFK people, a lot of the lone nutters are probably lean more conservative and then a lot of the people that want to tear up the fbi or blame the fbi or cia for killing kennedy would be liberal and i happen to fall in like i said that agnostic area where i just kind of look at the facts of the matter and i see a lot more with just issues in a cover-up rather than looking at you know i think the who and the why and all that was good and it's been getting us to the 60 year mark but at this point i just go use everything we've learned now forget the who and the why and let's just make a documented thing of like a live court proceeding none of this 9 11 closed door stuff i was like you they blame conspiracies for everything. If you start mentioning, like, why was it closed door? Why was it this? Why are the families worrying about scrap being sold a week later? I was like, you wouldn't have any of this if you were just open about it and you did it live on television where I don't have to watch you go. It's like the UFO thing. I mean, this is the easiest example to go into. The reason why, and I'm not trying to connect all these, but the reason why I said that is there there was a Robertson panel that came out um, and these were just scientists, but they were basically hired because of their esteemed credits. The issue was that they weren't really supposed to be given full documentation on what aliens or whatever they had that was recorded about that because that's national security. They have to keep that on the locks. But to the public, it was a display of like you got the best scientists and research, just like the Warren Commission was. It was about having these star-studded casts, which is what the public needs. They need an answer from all these esteemed military people because obviously they have such big careers. They're going to do the correct job, and they'll do it, and we don't ever have to question it. The thing with the Robertson panel is that eventually all these scientists who had – pensions and all these things were being labeled tinfoil hat and nut jobs and some of them did kill themselves because of the credit and the labeling and that's what we've done now is that we've gotten people to a position where there's critical thinking rational things you can't talk about and rational things you can't bring up as questions and now you're demonized for asking such and you cause labels on people whether you call them a trump supporter a maga whatever you want to call them to the point where now we've done the work for them They've divisivized the populations to turn on each other over the smallest things to where we can never question the real things of what's going on. The issue then becomes the double standard I don't like. 
There's a double standard where people will not question the Martin Luther King assassination saying if you say the FBI killed Martin Luther King. Nobody will question it because there's a past track history record of a certain abuses towards a certain race. But then when you question the JFK thing, people will go, oh, that's conspiratorial. There's no double standard there. It's people in positions of power that will abuse the shit out of it because they know they can get away with it because whether it's race, whether it's whatever, whether it's your position on the scale and the world order of things. And that's what should be the message that people should be receiving but that doesn't go through hmm. yeah oh just wondering about the mlk the martin luther king assassination so you're suggesting that the reason why there is comparatively less desire to re-examine the case is because it fits a liberal narrative of black men being shot by white racists no, I'm talking about the fact that the people that will die on the lone nutter field, the people that will say it was Lee Harvey Oswald that did it, um, they write books saying that the FBI or whatever will kill MLK. And I'm like, well, why is that? And I've had Posner and all those names on the show before, and they've talked about – because there's plenty of evidence. I was like, but there's evidence on the Lee Harvey Oswald thing as well too. I just think that's it's it. I mean, I looked into the whole history of disabilities and look at the number of people that had like were labeled ADHD or whatever that would get a lobotomy or be locked inside of sane asylums. And you wonder why it lasted for so long was because the reporters and all these people didn't want to go and talk to people in prisoners because they considered them to have no value, didn't want to talk to people in a sane asylums because they might be nuts or something of that sort. And it's the labeling aspect where it was like, so this scandal went on for how long and nobody reported on it because of the fact that you didn't consider these people human beings? Like, yeah. Hmm. Did I make that I explain myself a little more. I mean, if you, if you disagree with me, go ahead. Yeah, it's yeah, it's just that I think the the, the whole James Roe Ray thing. Uh, my always thing about that is whatever the truth of what happened is that it was almost too convenient. I mean, look at look at let's forget uh, Ray for a second. Let's look at Oswald. I mean, social loser we think, uh, communist dissident we think, defector and then redefector we know. Um. The guy is so almost beautifully unstable and politically suspect that he fits the pattern of the narrative. And I think part of what's going on here, perhaps, is that if the accused conforms with a whole variety of political and social and cultural prejudices, then there will be a kind of collective disinclination to consider an alternative because, in a sense, the comfort factor is so high with the narrative that you've got because of the identity of the protagonist. And so I'm wondering if the same thing is, is as well with, with, uh, with King. That in fact, that, that from what we know of James Earl Ray, he was such a deplorable racist, as far as we know, in many ways, that the narrative is, it's, it's closed, it's neat. It, it makes us feel good about ourselves, precisely because we have in fact stigmatized a white guy for murdering a black man. And it, and it conforms with our expectations of of the nature of white racism well there's always need to be a jesus on a cross and a devil to burn there always has to be one individual i mean alan dulles has that quote with lee harvey oswald when he talked about that every assassination political assassination throughout history has been done with a lone nut except for abraham lincoln and that is in quotes so you just start going like i mean I get like the public needs that as much as they need a star studded cast to do an investigation, but it's a little bit deeper than that. I mean, if you look through Hoover and what he does with COINTELPRO and the Black Panther Party, he did the same thing with homosexuals in cinema. He did the same thing with so much of it. And it was just like getting rid of this purest aspect of or whatever. I mean, I mean, there's theories about Hoover being an address, and I've seen the photos. So I'm like, <laughs> there's a big double standard there too. But it is like this weird thing, like even in society, I guess what I meant with the MLK and the JFK thing is when you try and talk about it from like a social standpoint, whether it's against your common public or other social groups, or even in Facebook forums as well too, the JFK... JFK thing gets a ton of resistance against or by the lone nutter crowd. But then if you even talk about the subject of MLK, a lot of them will just go silent on it. And it's not that they don't have an opinion on it. It's that there's a there's that 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 the racial thing where that gets involved and they go, I don't even want it because they'll get public right. outrage right. if they refuse right. that. That's right. my point. Right. Right. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was saying maybe the other side is that precisely because the identity of the villain, I mean, let me put it this way. Let's go back to 9-11. Let's hypothetically, let's just speculate that 9-11 was a conspiracy of some kind. I'm not saying, I'm not taking a position on this, okay? I'm just saying hypothetically it was. 
And let's suppose we got some of these people and got them off Guantanamo Bay and actually would there have been any possibility of, of, of a fair trial? Or would the cultural baggage of the accused be so great as to convict them on that fact alone, independent of the evidence? I think... In other words, the story is so good, it has to be true. Yeah, I, I, and it's, it's a, the media thing as well, too. Look at Lee Harvey Oswald, trial by media. Even if he lived, would he, would he get a fair trial? Well, yeah, no, he would have been shot in the court. <laughs> <laughs> he can't have been shot in the police station. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, in, in Spectrum of Post, like I actually touched on that very, very briefly about Osama bin Laden, about when he actually looked, I, it, this just struck me out of nowhere. I didn't, I didn't know I was going in this direction, but I kind of revisited in my, in my love about the following year, is that when you look at the, at the media profile of Osama bin Laden, it comes awfully close to the mad Arab Abdul al Hazarad. I mean, he's the leader of an underground death cult. He has almost occult or supernatural paranormal powers he's in communion with dark forces and he has this this disparate web of of fanatical maniacal slaves who are out to destroy western civilization and uh, the elimination of the uh, the anglo-saxon race so you know i'm just saying is that if they wanted a kind of a cultural template to frame the osama bin laden story and of course a little bit that's trickled out about him i mean is seemingly indicating that he really wasn't anything at all like we kind of thought that he was, especially since he seemed to be watching porno, bill, porno videos in a house in Pakistan when they finally nailed him. That I'm just, I'm, I'm just kind of, I was kind of thinking out loud, was this the archetype? Was this the literary metaphor that they were using? For I think you know, it, the mad Arab of the desert. I think if you look deeper into that, and I have through the Islamic terrorism angle, um, Mike Springman, who did Al Qaeda's for our uh, visas for Al Qaeda, I think his book is called. Um, he talked about that there are certain red flags and certain things that you would flag on people's visas, and when the this is the more like the I, I like I said nine eleven topic. I'm a little bit agnostic on, but this is what I've seen largely from the community is that they had these people under surveillance long before the attacks even happened, um, and the visas part. I had him tell me straight up that he rejected visas, and this is what he wrote his book about, for the some of the names of the people that ended up hijacking the plane. Now, what happened next was that the CIA pushed those through. Now, do I understand what that is? No, but without getting super duper conspiratorial into it, there was a whole shift change right after that where we've labeled a bunch of things and any race – in that race in particular as Islamic terrorism, like we immediately think terrorists. And I start going, is this not brainwashing? It was the same thing that they made us fear either gay people or fear all this other stuff. And it's like, does that come from media or does that come from a certain agenda? I don't like, I, I couldn't give you a documented proof of this is what it is, but I can tell you, I wouldn't put it above the government for labeling a certain thing for an intended reason that they had behind the works. Right. No, I <laughs> And it sucks that I can't talk about this with average people without them being like, oh, my God. And it's like, damn it. I know I was trying to think of trying to frame a very careful answer. But I mean, but all I would simply say is, is that you, if you forget the particularities of 9-11 and simply look at standard intelligence and counterintelligence, including domestic surveillance and spying, including against one's own citizens, that sort of practice that got red flagged is pretty much standard procedure. Well, even like the modern day conspiracy today, if you listen back to like Hale Boggs interview um, in 71, I think it was. I don't know if you know who Hale Boggs is. No, I. Yeah. Well, he he makes it very public on the thing. And this is I think Hoover wasn't exposed until 74. But he talked about the fact that Hoover was up to wiretapping on other congressmen and doing a bunch of stuff. And the reporter goes, what's your evidence? He goes, this sounds like a bunch of nonsense. And Boggs is like, you just wait till it comes out. Next year, Boggs' plane goes missing over Alaska. We don't need to talk about that. But in 74, it gets exposed. And it was like, well, okay, so me as a person, as soon as I started hearing him talk, I go, I know, already know the end game. I already know what comes out later. I already know about Hoover. But in this moment, if I was thinking from their point of view, I would immediately said conspiracy, or I would have said, this doesn't sound real at all because no one can think that about your government. Even diving through history, some of the stuff I'm reading, I'm like, Jesus, no way. I was like, this has to be like a fake document or something like that. But no, it ends up being, turns out they are up to stuff like that. Like yeah, like the, when the North, the, like the Northwood document. I mean, it, it was so good you couldn't make it up. They called it fake recently. 
Yeah. Well, there's 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 some grounds for questioning it. Uh, the one line of attack on it that I thought was kind of compelling, and I was talking to uh, Peter Dale Scott, a friend of mine, about it. And some of the wording in the text suggests an English author rather than an American author. From the phraseology, like holiday instead of vacation, that sort of thing. Um, but that could simply mean that somebody from MI5 or MI6 <laughs> had their hand in it as well. It wasn't just purely an American military intelligence operation. They, they you know, the, the Americans, the British, and the Israelis share an awful lot. I mean, there virtually is one in many, many instances. Um, but getting back to also the, the again, this, this is sort of what we're talking about on and off, the, the, th the cultural threshold of resistance to conspiracy. Another idea that I flitter with people who work in the field, and, and they felt that there was some, some meat to the issue, is that journalists, especially, you know, mainstream media, nationally established journalists, you know, the, um, oh, I forgot his name, the guy used to be on CBS, oh, Dan Rather, the, the Dan Rather syndrome, uh, is that they're, as a profession, egos aside, profession, they're very loath to consider conspiracy, especially at the national or federal level, to take that proposition seriously, because if there was one, they wouldn't be in on it. <laughs> in other words, they would have to admit that there were chan entire channels of information that explain everything that they've actually been sequestered from, which undermines their cultural and social position as the arbiters of truth. In other words, it can't possibly be going on because if it was going on, we would either know it as a matter of fact, or we would have to know it as a matter of policy. And would, therefore, what, 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 what have we got at the end of the day if we're actually locked out of this stuff that's actually the most important and the most sensitive? I would agree with that. And then I would also toss in some of the people that think that they're not going to report on it because they're being a patriot to their country. There's this strong idolization or this ideology out there of um, being like Alan Dulles. You can look at – I've talked to Dave Talbot, um, and he goes, well, Alan Dulles wasn't looking at it like how we would look at it as morally wrong. He was saying I'm, I'm going to have to do the things that I need to do to save my country, You know, things right. that people well, are strong enough that's to That's what he would say, wouldn't yeah. he? <laughs> So, I mean, it wasn't the same as the Swiss bank accounts, but yeah. But when you look at it from like that perspective, I think it gets people a little bit easier to understand a lot of this stuff as well, too. Because like when you lay out like a historical track record of like a lot of the stuff we know about the JFK stuff, there's a large thing of like, this is too orchestrated. It sounds like a movie. And it was like, well, let me tell you, half of these people probably made it up as they went along. You know, a lot of this stuff, it wasn't just like besides the beginning and maybe more towards the cover up aspect things. You're just having people that are problems are coming up and they're trying their best to get rid of it. And if we want to talk about, yeah, if we don't want to talk about the Dallas thing in a little bit more detail, one of the historical complications, and it's partly a question of archival research, that's the issue here is that if we take sort of, and I'll simply call it the worst case scenario, which is there actually was some kind of intra-governmental, maybe organized crime, probably Cuban anti-Castro resistance paramilitary nexus, a, a, a converging of forces uh, behind it, you've got the temporal or sequential problem of conspiracy and then cover up. And people tend to conflate the thing into a single phenomenon, right? If there was a conspiracy, I speculate. I'm talking about the, the whole Dallas shooting as, as a spectacle in the way that Guy Debord meant to spectacle. It would most likely, if it happened, it most likely would have been done on a much lower level, almost a street level sort of thing. Maybe a couple mafia people maybe some CIA informants and probably some anti-Castro paramilitaries. And it wouldn't take much to do the actual shooting and then the business with Oswald first in the theater and then the police, Dallas, the police station with Jack Ruby just coming out of nowhere. Right? That wouldn't have taken a lot to pull that off. But the cover-up, which in fact we know much more about, we're much more, we have we're much more solid grounds about the cover-up aspect of things. Uh, requires a lot of top-level extensive coordination. Now, if you 
make, I think, what's a logical error of assuming that the shooting and the cover-up of the shooting are a single thing, then you've got the same group doing both things. And I think that's a red herring. And I think a lot of people have gone down cul-de-sacs thinking that <laughs> they've, got, they've got to integrate the entire event into a, a package, which then he speaks or signifies something like a a coordinated and centrally organized deep state behind the whole thing. I think what we're looking at really is think certain things which are clearly conspiratorial, but some of which are haphazard and thrown together or have just come together almost accidentally. If we're looking at, let's say, the cover-up side of things, one reason why we know, and we're all virtually certain today, that there was a cover-up was to, one, make sure that the CIA or maybe the FBI as well, and also military intelligence, never forget the... the uh, DEA as being a key player in all of this, cover up all records of their knowledge of Oswald's activities, even before he even entered into the Marines. Okay. That had to be gotten rid of. And also to cover up any at signs of a lapse of national security procedures. And that, of course, involves a Secret Service, that they basically botched the job. The FBI agent host James Hostie did not file his reports correctly whatever so if we've got the need to basically establish plausible denial of knowledge of oswald and make sure that there's no evidence of lapses in national security procedure coupled with the need to also make sure there's no disclosure about unrelated but very extensive domestic intelligence spying operations then that creates a real machine. I mean, I mean, a serious effort to cover up something which could have been done by about a dozen part characters who are only very weakly connected to the entire national security apparatus. And I think, I, I'm sorry, I think to, to really get anywhere at all with Dallas in a meaningful and intelligent way, you've really got to parse the narrative. You've really got to break it down into a number of different sub-narratives and component parts and do not try to impose some kind of grand unifying theory of everything upon it because it won't work i i would agree and then there's only some parts i would disagree which would just be i believe it came orchestrated from the top um what i mean when it came orchestrated from the top i mean just get, you can get a couple of low guys to implement the plan but when it comes to just a cia director or an fbi director i blame hoover more than i blame lyndon johnson for stuff i blame lyndon johnson for the cover-up i think a lot of people look for parse motive and they try and find like well lyndon johnson became president and all his scandals dropped and that's well, why I mean, Oliver, i'm sorry i'm sorry Oliver Stone, right i can't i kind of like jfk right the the big the rosetta stone of the, of the conspiracy culture. Okay, I agree with what James Elroy wrote about it, and I that's his take on JFK in uh, in my book on Elroy. He simply says, "Is is somebody asked him? He said, what do you think of JFK?'" He says, "Look, I take it home, I watch it at least once a month, but only at the ninety fifth minute, right? Then I can't refuse to watch anymore." He said it was beautiful up to the point that they went to trial. But as soon as Donald Sutherland shows up as Colonel X, he's out the whole plot. He says, that's when I lose it and I can't stand watching it. Um, and he and that in that film, I don't know if um, this was actually raised at the trial. But he actually says he actually has Kevin Costner stand up and say. In the event of a homicide, you determine who the primary suspect is by who benefits from the murder. Well, who benefited from the murder of JFK? Well, LBJ did. Ergo, LBJ did it somehow, or he was in on it. Now, I'm sorry, that is about as logically inconsequential as it gets. No, that's that's what I was saying. I was like, a lot of people strike LBJ as the one that did it, and I go, you wouldn't sit your. First of all, the, the common example is you would not sit your car right behind JFK's when the shots are being rung out. If we know from the James Tag bullet that just if there's a possibility you and your wife are going to get hit if you're riding behind him, you wouldn't be in Dallas or in that motorcade at all. You'd be standing. And then it brings it back to why would Oswald only bring four bullets to kill the president? Why would he three? Why would he shoot three shots and then reload if you just watched Kennedy's head blow off? And there's a a couple holes in there. But what I 
what I would just say is the who and the why is always this answer that needs to be drawn out there. I go, if you have one person, FBI director, who could manipulate part of the cover up then? Look at the people. I mean, that's the thing is like there's has to be this Jesus and a devil that someone needs to attack. And I go, here's the thing as an intelligence agency and the Warren Commission even stated this is that the CIA withheld documents from the Warren Commission. Blakey even admitted the CIA withheld documents from him when I spoke with Blakey on the show. But if you look at both of those investigations, Warren Commission was just Oswald did it. We're going to show you how. And Blakey was just look over the Warren Commission, but none of the government secrets, none of the stuff we should have got transparency about really got exposed. The closest thing we ever got to exposure would have been the church committee, and even they didn't talk about the JFK assassination. They just talked about prior plots, and there was no ramifications for that, and they go, well, some of these people that you know they're holding documents because of names involved. I go, it's just like JFK with the Bay of Pigs. Bay of Pigs wasn't JFK's. It was Eisenhower's baby. JFK took the blame of it for being chief of staff. What does an intelligence agency do? Well, look at everything that's been for part of the cover-up, has been to respect the agency's credibility in the eyes of the American people. The reason why Dallas police could have no Jack Ruby connections, because your police force can't have connections with a strip club owner or a mafia guy. It looks bad. That's why they didn't do it. It's not some grandiose, like deep, maybe DPD definitely had involvement in the cover-up, sure. But when it comes to the whole... Everyone goes, DPD was in charge of the plot. I go, no. I go, everybody, it, the intelligence agency covering up their mistakes, covering up if they had a low-level guy that did the plot. It's respecting their credibility. Yeah, it, it's just that this it's moments like this you have to be so careful as a researcher and as an analyst and as, and as a commentator to separate unified substances, things which are like, for example, the CIA clearly ran the anti-Castro Cubans in Louisiana and Texas and Florida, MGA way, JM way, that sort of thing. And again, the pile up of different entities, unconnected, but acting in parallel manner because they have common interests, which usually involve non-disclosure and plausible denial. Okay. And that effect, it, it, it's, 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 I hate the word dialectical, but it is almost dialectical. The two things are actually constantly interfacing with each other. The actual institutions, as opposed to the actions of entities or sub-bodies who are all converging on certain, trying to arrange certain outcomes, which meet everyone's interests. And also about the, the Warren Commission, I just wanted to mention something which I don't think gets appreciated enough. One of, first of all, there's not going to be any big, I would doubt very much there's going to be any big release of JFK documents in the sense that anything we, there will be no big reveal because anything that would constitute a big reveal would never have been written down in the first place. 100%. Almost certain. Well, okay. I'll, you say 100%. I'll say 99%, but okay. I'm saying 100%. We're, 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 we're on the same at, page. If we're on the at, same page with that one. If you but, look at 1035, 960 at the bottom of that document, it says destroy what no longer needed. I'm like, it's gone if it is written down. Okay. But the other thing is, which, and it's kind of a legal point, and people don't pick up on this. Maybe it's about good, but one of the things that the most recent release did confirm although we all kind of pretty much knew it, but it made it concrete, is that Hoover and the FBI had already arrived at a predetermination of Oswald's sole guilt. And they more or less instructed the Warren Commission to confirm their findings, which means that from a perspective of legal procedure, the Warren Commission's findings are invalid because they were operating upon a predetermined conclusion from the beginning. That invidiates the entire purpose of an exploratory or investigatory. I agree. I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't think we're disagreeing at all, really. In any no, no, we're not disagreeing. I'm saying, but that's an aspect of it that I think is very important that a lot isn't as well known as it should be. It's like, what are they covering up? What are they covering up? What? The Warren Commission was doing very, in many ways, was doing little more than providing a spectacle, which was really a rubber stamping of the FBI's position. 
that's what I was saying earlier about the 13 members and the giant you know, backgrounds that they all have, the military experiences. The public needs this like 18 style thing to happen where this – you know that their findings are good. There's no need to question those. But yeah, and I mean that just lands us in a really shitty place as people if we if that's what we need for an acceptance thing. It's like a seal with a fish. You just kind of clap your hands. I'm like, well, hang on a second. But – some researchers did do work. Some scholars did. They read the 26 volumes. It didn't match the report, but you know, everyone just wants the brief little thing. And I mean, I, I believe a lot of people just don't want to know a lot of this stuff because they just, they don't want to know. And that's fine. But also I don't like it when it's gotten to this point now that when you do try and find something like I read a oh, months ago about Biden using psychological weapons or something like that. And he apologized for it. And it was on Fox. It was on CNN. They printed a New York post printed something about it as well, too. I want to go Google it to be like, I got to fact check myself again. I got to look to find that article again, but I pulled it up on air and you can find the episode where I did that and talked about it. But then when I went to go find it, it wasn't on Google. And I'm like, what the hell's going on here? I know I've showed the article. I've had it screenshotted. I was going to have it in my film, but it's disappeared. And that's what it is, is that this it's a cover up again, but it's like in this aspect, it's like when you do find out some serious stuff, when you do get some transparency, when you do get a little sliver of what is going on behind the curtains, it just disappears. So it's like even for the people that want to sort it out and find it and want to know this for me, I want to know there's people that don't want to know that's your choice. But for me, I want to know. Yeah, let me ask you a question. This is I don't have an answer. I just have a question. This is kind of a, a generational thing, because like I said. By the time I finished law school, this is just when the internet was just beginning, okay? So we're going, looking back to the early 1990s here. But would you say that it's kind of a, a social prejudice, or maybe I should say a cultural prejudice that we have, that if something's not on Google, not findable on Google, then there's a very good chance that that thing, whatever it is, does not actually exist? I would agree with a, a lot of that. Um, not from just for my generation, me p particularly, if I don't find it on Google, I know a lot of people talk about like duck, duck go, but that's owned by Google as well too. Um, so I, I, for me, if I don't find it on the internet, I just start going, I, I, I mean, to try and brag about this to the public, I would need a Google thing. I would need something from that. Because I, I wonder what's, what's happened to our collective political consciousness, which should always be a, a healthy skepticism. I mean, ideally is that it's not, you see, I think that there's a difference between saying if I can not find something, that doesn't mean it's not there, it just could be hidden, is beginning to give way to if I can not find it, it's not there, which is the same thing as not existing. I think that is what's happening. Yeah, I think so too. It's Russell's teapot, but in fucking political format. <laughs> um, it, I mean, it sucks, but that, I mean, it's the same thing when you when like when I'm looking on Wikipedia or something, and I only look on Wikipedia because I go if I say something and someone goes to type it in their computer, what's going to be the top result is typically a Wikipedia thing. So when they click it, what are they going to come across, and is it validated on there? Well, I have friends that edit Wikipedia, and you see a lot of this stuff as well too. There's certain political things that kind of get pushed in with some of this stuff as well too, like they'll really highlight a certain feature like a hardcore republican will be the stated thing and i'm just like okay well i mean i looking at a person's wikipedia page what what work have they done besides just calling them a hardcore republican um but if when well, you that explains everything right you don't need to know anything more than that you you attach the correct label and you've got the truth but when i was looking through lee harvey oswald and i came down to a certain i've read this on the show before because to me it's just nuts is when uh, what is it? Uh, Dallas Police Department talked about or no, it was FBI talked about one of the people, the clerks there says that Oswald came in three weeks before the assassination, threatening to blow the place up. And then it says period. And it says, but accounts vary as whether he was going to blow it up or just simply report it to higher authorities. And I'm like, this isn't fucking Coke and Diet Coke. This is this is what people are going to click on the first result for Lee Harvey Oswald and read that. And I go, that's what. And it, it makes me so pissed because I go, I want the public to little, think a little bit farther than that and maybe go to a thing, but they need that recognition from Wikipedia. They need that recognition from Google. And I just start going, it's much like if you get a bunch of top authorities controlling a bunch of little, small, little number guys, it doesn't need to be the whole agency involved. Just get Google in line, get Amazon, get anybody that's the number one results in line and everyone else is, it's not going to matter. Right. Yeah, and I and I think um, I forget what her name is, but there is a very good critic um, 
cultural critic in Britain. I think she works for I, works for the Independent. I think I forget the lady's name, but she came out. She made this brilliant statement. She said she why she doesn't have a cell phone, and she says, "Well, because I don't have a cell phone because it's not a cell phone; it's a spy phone." And I refuse to carry a spy phone around with me. Because every time I switch it on, I'm, I'm being spied on. And I mean, we all know about, you know, the algorithms and the trackings and all the implants and the nudgings. Is that I think we reached a point whereby we can no longer consider ourselves to be valid social actors unless we have the entire infrastructure of virtual reality backing us up with what we say. We've, we've, we've got to be plugged in, otherwise we're not real. And that I, and if that is true, then the next step, and this is more of a question of the unconscious rather than the collective unconscious, rather than the individual conscious, is that the the universe cannot be anything other than I the, the way that I perceive it, because if it is, that means there's something I don't know, and we've convinced ourselves that we are in a position of actually knowing simply because we're logged in. I'm so happy. I, I agree that I know nothing. I just, I live by that mentality just because even when I talk to someone and I don't believe in a flat earth at all, but I, when I hear them out and I have that conversation and we kind of start talking, I go, I see your perspective. I don't necessarily agree, but I see like the kind of lines that you're connecting to. A lot of it's on the basis of NASA lied about the original photos of like the earth and I was like, okay, so you have just distrust. I understand that. I get that 100%. And I don't want to obviously lump all these together, but it starts coming from this era of like, I don't either want to know or I just, just want to naturally distrust. And I was like, I think you should think and have questions about stuff. We were taught that through school, but you ask a question now and people put a red like target on your forehead. And it's like- what Yeah, but why is that? The, why is that exactly? Because I, I don't know. We all want to believe in a happy- world that we're not in a dome i don't know, I have no clue man yeah um i think it's kind of self it's kind of what we would call cruel optimism you have to feel happy no matter what you, you wind up making yourself far more miserable in the long term but i i think it's 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 kind of um uh see the trouble is conversations like this always tend to go real downhill real fast because you're engaging in kind of like cultural criticism and aesthetic judgments and um moral righteousness and that sort of thing but i think that the world that we've entered into through virtual media is a wet dream for national intelligence and security even if for no other reason other than the fact that the way that the consensus that is generated through virtual technological means is one that just it, it just doesn't put thoughts in your mind or keep other thoughts from coming to your mind. It changes your entire sense of your capacity for perception. And, 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 and it's interesting, I mean, I'm, again, not taking whether I'm a Republican or Democrat or an independent or what, one of the things I've also noticed interesting, we were talking about this a little or about how the FBI and the CIA today are much more popular on the liberal left than they are on the conservative right. Is that and is that how in the debate between left and right, the left is not? It's always assumed a position of moral righteousness in a way, but it's assuming a position of actual cognitive superiority. That the left, that the right, isn't just wrong. It may or may not be wrong. But the right is fundamentally stupid, and that the conservative is somebody who's actually suffering from intellectual and cognitive impairment. Now, that also may be correct, but the problem is, is that how do you verify that? What justifies it? And as far as I can tell, the justification is intellectual inferiority as proven by political dissent. The fact that you do not agree is actually a form of stupidity rather than a form of principled resistance or principled skepticism or simply a kind of a libertarian, an emotive libertarian reluctance to defer to authority overly easily. I, I think it's 
been slow programming. I hate to say it like that, but I, I, I just think if you look at like Anderson Cooper and like, I, I don't believe in any of these media sites, I really don't care for them, but they had the, during the COVID thing, they had the Las Vegas mayor involved and he was talking about restrictions for the restaurants. He goes, aren't you going to follow like what China is doing with, you know, these proper procedures in the restaurants and the Las Vegas ladies went, this isn't China. This is Las Vegas, Nevada. And I just went, God damn it. I just went like, you can't get anybody that can sit in a room with you and just have this back and forth. But it needs to be like he even called her ignorant on air. And it was like this kind of moral superiority of like, you're not as intelligent as me. And then when I go to like to like Tucker Carlson, which I only did recently because of the JFK stuff he started talking about, but that was just that brief segment. He had one of my friends, Jim on and they, or no, it was Walsh. Walsh is who it was invited my friend Jim DiGino on and they go, what do you, who do you think did it? What's in these documents? And I was like, that's a really dumb question to ask any JFK researcher. And Jim just goes, I don't know, but I can tell you, I want more documents. I go, that's the way you should have did it. Because if you would have said it was the CIA, if you would have said anything like that, people would have tuned out and that would have been the end of the discussion. But that's what they wanted. They wanted that clickbait and they wanted that. And I go, so I like the Hill. I liked them for a while. I know they had a feud a little bit. I like the Intercept. I think they're getting a lot more steam as well, too. But it's this idea of like, I mean, even the CIA, the whole flip around with that is because they just started talking about like we have transgender employees and a bunch of things of this sort. And I just start going, oh, my God, it's like when all the companies started switching their pictures, the rainbow pictures, nobody's actually buying this. Right. And I don't think people do, but I think they tell themselves that this is true. And then it helps them like the corporations that they obviously everyone talks shit on Amazon on but we all go there so it's like i think it justifies that and i hate to say it like that because i know people can go like well you don't believe in this i'm like oh, no it's not saying i don't believe in any of that it's just there's a concept out there that this is the way that social society is going let's hop on that bandwagon and find a way to profit that's not crazy i think that's pretty realistic on a lot let's, of things let's, let's walk capitalism i mean what point did capitalism magically become an altruistic economic system Right. In other, in other words, the very fact that woke capitalism is pushed as hard as it is should make us suspicious for it, precisely because it's still capitalism. The logic of capitalism is to commodify and max, maximize profits over time to, to stave off the inevitability of a permanent crisis of profitability. Right. So, and again, I mean, it's an intergenerational thing, but I, I sometimes get the impression I, I woke up one morning and then everybody says that corporations are cool. You've, <laughs> They they've got rainbow encoded products. I mean, I mean, no, oh, it sells. That's why they're doing it. Why it sells is is I think the more important question. But there there there's there's no question. I mean, when did these changes happen so that we're now in a new era in which we can then say with total moral confidence that everything that's come before us is total crap? Do you think that? some of those corporations might be forced change. Like, I don't, I don't think all of them are evil. I believe some are kind of forced into maybe a new model of thinking um, on some things and maybe they adapt some principles. I do believe heavily that the society is very influenced by capitalism. I think that's a basic fact. Um, and I don't believe every corporate, I don't believe Disney for a damn minute. If you look at Disney's past, I go, there's no fucking way. They were pen, well, all Disney was pen pals with fucking Hoover. Um, but there's a lot of things where I start noticing even like, like I wouldn't say guidelines, but certain lines just start moving. They just start keep extending farther and farther across the board. Like everything, nobody just stops at one cookie. Usually it ends up, you take a couple more than that after you like the taste of it. And I think that's an easier way to explain. But I think when we look at the internet, I think people think that the internet is going to have every single thing you can possibly have. And I go, well, that's, yeah, that's what I mean. Sure. And if something doesn't show up, then what is the cognitive response to that? Well, it, there can't be anything to it if it's not there, which is totally illogical. That's a complete non sequitur. But that does seem to be, I mean, social psychology is a really dubious concept, right? But from I got a social, a <laughs> social, a social psychological uh, perspective that 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 does seem to be where we're going if 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 it does not manifest it cannot be true as opposed to we don't know what's not manifesting so we may have to keep our mouth shut he's like wittgenstein right that of which we cannot speak we must remain silent is not the same thing as saying if i don't see it it ain't there those are two totally different worldviews 
It's, I mean, it, there's not a way to fix that with the way we've implemented technology into our lives. I mean, it wasn't like this in the beginning stages of the internet, but it's gotten to this point now. If anyone's interested in doing JFK research, the really good piece of advice I got from Peter Dale Scott once was, because I was writing my book and I said, okay, I'm going to not talk about the Zerbruder film. I'm not going to talk about the Zerbruder film. And then I had to talk about the Zerbruder film on like page 147, okay? I had to do it. And I said, how do I handle this? And he says, look, he said, if you're talking about Dallas, do not talk about DV Plaza no matter what. Do not become imprecated and entangled in the actual mechanics of the shooting. Because he said, there is every single thing you will come up with will be subjected to at least six lines of attack from somebody else. I mean, you're, I'm pretty sure you're aware of the, the skip in the film. There are two frames that may have been cut out because it affects his head movement, forward, back, forward, you know, back to the left, back to the left, back, forward, back, forward, back. And I mean, I've looked at it myself. I've spent two days going, looking at 15 different things, and everybody's got a different group of what happened. No, it hasn't been edited. Yes, that is. Okay. And who am I to judge? Not me, right? Okay. So I think that as far as the, the information, disinformation, misinformation thing that we have to live with today, is do not get unduly bound down to the mechanical details of it. It has, you have to frame it, I think, more in terms of, I, well, that's why, okay, let me put it this way. The, the one thing, if you haven't read it, I'm sure you have, but anyone out there who hasn't read it, the thing to read about the JFK assassination is Don DeLillo's book, Libra. Okay? That is the best thing ever written on the JFK assassination and Oswald. And one reason why it's so great is that he has to narratively come up to the problem. He wants to make Oswald the lone shooter, but he is linked to a CIA outfit that's running a local group of anti-Castro Cubans, okay? So he has to get Oswald into the conspiratorial chain of command. But what he knows perfectly well, and this is what's bedeviled every single researcher into Dealey Plaza, is that we can't figure out the exact physical sequence in which Oswald may have been actually incorporated into something larger, okay? So what he does, and he solves the problem brilliantly, every alternating chapter in Libra is Oswald's first person narrative, right? Uh, we get third person, first person, third person, first person, third person, first person, okay? And then right up to the moment in which Oswald, speaking in first person, is about to talk to the guy who's actually a cast anti-Castro Cuban pro-CIA operative informant, it then flips. And then when we see Oswald next time, he's now Leon. And he's now part of the group. In other words, he jumps the gap. Right? We've got all this evidence making us have good grounds for being suspicious about Oswald, and we've got all the evidence about what the Cubans were doing. How do you actually get them together? What's the mechanics of it? What are the physical lines of causality? He doesn't. What he does is he does a brilliant literary edit job of simply taking him right up to the brink and then just moving him to the other side. But it's that gap, that transitional gap that no one's been able to find. And if you become too hung up on that, you will eventually just wind up treading water. Because you've, 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 you've almost got to take almost like a, a systems analysis type of approach. I've tried my best when it comes to, like, I mean, I've talked about, I've stayed an agnostic on the Zapruder film. I talked about it when I was first learning about it. Um, and even the backyard photographs, I would stay agnostic on that too. Now, what I have done because a lot of people say the photo was manipulated. And look, I get it. Three things, it's kind of weird for a photo. I've seen the headline ups and all the photo shots. I still would stay agnostic. But one thing I, I did on my own research was I checked his autopsy report because one thing I, I go, I go, his, maybe his jaw was a little bit bigger. I go, he could have had a, a tooth infection. We know Oswald's missing a tooth from his high school photograph. So that could be a possible thing. I think that's good research or at least a good critical thinking thing. I went into his autopsy and said he had he had the excellent teeth and i go well i don't think 
that's necessarily true, but okay, so we're still going to stay agnostic on there. But one thing I thought was weird, and I even brought this up with Blakey when I spoke with Blakey, was about a gunshot wound he received in the line of duty from his military career before. I checked his autopsy. There was no scarring from two years before where he had this gunshot wound. So I go, well, that's weird because they included that he had marks on his wrist from when he attempted to kill himself when he was in the Russia or whatever. So I go, well, they included that, but they didn't include a scarring from a gunshot wound. So I started thinking, I go, maybe it was the people that tried to get out of war and, you know, they would talk about getting an injury and then get sent back home. Yeah, self-inflicted well, wounds. Yeah. He did fall in the category two years or it was it two or three years before they changed what legally could get you out of service so maybe someone saw that he went and experienced combat saw maybe he was scared a little bit and just wanted to be sent home and then whatever happened after that i couldn't tell you so there was like a lot of th things i thought of critical thinking wise that i was trying my best to go through there but the people that say the backyard photograph isn't manipulated and i then i just show like the hoover photograph and i go do you agree this is real like, is, if this is real, then you have to say the Oswald one is real, and they had the technology to do that back then. Or you could call them both fake. And what's more easier example for the public to get on about Hoover? Well, Hoover liked to bet at the track, and the mob owned the track. That's just – that's more logical and business standpoint that can get everybody on board. So there's things that I would mention, but I wouldn't lead off with. You know what I mean? I wouldn't say this is what's going to convince you. I would say, no, here's the more logical one, and then here's the added little sugar on top of your ice cream. You know what I mean? Like I feel like that helps out a little bit, but there's so much of like the conspiracy stuff where people – I don't – and I get it if you're selling a book. I understand. Trust me. But there are sometimes like I even with had con con talks with Anthony Summers and even David Lifton. I think it changed a couple of things that he put in the original best evidence. But it's just like the JFK film. What did it initially do? What did it add? And I believe Oliver Stone – I've never seen the JFK movie, um, but – I know I got to watch it, but I got to wait until I get my project done. Um, but when it comes to the ending, what he incorporated at the ending and what the main message of that film was, write your congressman because all these documents are still sealed and the people did. That is something that where you start noticing how powerful the people are when you unite as one. And that's something that I thought was the best aspect of that film. Wasn't the added details in the story and how good it was to eat popcorn through it. It was that ending message where someone was so impacted by something to write their congressman and establish the AARB. And I go, that's what, you know, we got to, that's the stuff you got to focus on when it comes to Dealey Plaza. What's the historical fact that everyone can agree upon? Oswald got the job at the book depository on October 18th. His daughter was born on the 20th. Kennedy's route wasn't published until November 17th or 19th to go right past the book depository building. He had five days to prepare, picked one of the smallest windows when he could have picked the opposite corner and had the same uh, from a different angle, but could have had a way better shot. They Warren Commission said that he stacked boxes. OK, we'll we'll leave that out. But then I just bring up the example. If he had five days to prepare, Kennedy made three speeches in Dallas in the, in the two days before he was killed. He could have shot him at a fucking podium, not when he's moving in a moving vehicle with a really crappy rifle. And I go, if you can't think of That's this. the worst rifle of all time, apparently. So, yeah. so I'm like, if you can't, if the public can't see that and be like, yeah. And then I don't know what else to do besides, you know, the government giving you the answer. Well, yeah, there's two on that as well when I was doing my own research on that, is that at one point, the because I, deep down, I hate the film. I mean, I agree with Elroy. It was beautifully done, but it's a mess, a monumental mess by the time you get to an at the end. That's my own take. But um, there's one thing he does that I, I very strongly object to, if, again, looking at it from the issue of, of political and historical research, is that he says the how... And the what doesn't matter. What matters is the why. Now, I think that's also illogical. I think in this case, and this is what my book's about, what that's worth, the how is important because the how explains the why. In other words, if it was a false flag operation, like Northwood, like Northwood lays out in, a, in an embryonic sort of way, then the very public nature of the shooting performed by a very certain type of person under a very specific set of circumstances would be essential to the enterprise. How easy is it to kill the president? Easy. All you do is you just poison him. 
I, I go through the doctor, set up an accident, blow blow up Air Force One, cause the engine to malfunction. There are lots of ways you can get somebody, right? But this is so monumentally spectacular what happens to him that I think the how, the, the shooting in Dealey Plaza, may provide a fortiori evidence of the why which was a false flag to instigate a military invasion of Cuba. Or the severing of what sort of may have been kind of a proto detentist movement inside the Kennedy administration. I mean, David Talbot's big on that one, right? Bobby and, and Johnny were actually bypassing the CIA to talk to the Russians directly. And maybe the Vietnamese and the Cubans too. And they had to shut down the, the back channel, which in a funny way, is exactly what happened to Nixon. Because Nixon also tried to do a run around both the CIA and the Pentagon in order to talk the Russians and Chinese directly, right? And look where that got him. Yeah, I had Jeff Shepard on here talk about some things that really changed the historical perspective I had on uh, Nixon a little bit. Um, mostly, I thought it was interesting when you saw him trying to make his own FBI and he went to Hoover to try and get Hoover to help him out. And Oh Hoover's yeah, that like, was the Hudson, the Hudson plan, wasn't it? Is that what you're referring to? I don't remember what the exact plan was, but I just know that Nixon went to Hoover about trying to help him and Hoover was like, I can't. And I was like, because Hoover was spreading himself very thin and we know about that now. But I just go. So Nixon was like, I'll make my own FBI. I'm like, God damn, man, if he didn't try as hard as this to do what he thought it was right. It wasn't right in some cases, but I don't I don't that whole 60s and 70s. It's just I'm learning way more about it. And that's kind of what I wanted to do with even talking about the JFK stuff is this, I just want to get the public in on the discussion because I mean, you, if you look at the first five episodes I did on JFK, I was like, what? Cause there was just so much. And these, you got to understand, it's like talking to Vince Salandria. I think I respect the hell out of that man. Um, you know, rest in peace. But when he was incorporated in like, I had Max Good on about his film when he was in that film, he was very like, it's all an orchestra. And he went really deep state really, really quick. And I'm like, shit, I'm, in the same boat as him, but I also am like taken back a little bit. Like that's a lot. And I go, you can't, you got to kind of warm people up to that. Like if I can get you here and if you can question this, then let me show you a little bit farther. And then maybe we can take a step back. We'll take like a, a Chris, like a Chris kit tea break or whatever you want to talk about. And then I give you a little bit more and I go, that's all it is. The public, I'm not worried about the who, the how, the why, any of that. I'm just going, here's from the year one of the assassination. And here's the almost 60 years we have now. And this is all documented. It's all been proven. I could show you videotapes. I could show you a document about all that. Cause there's stuff in the new release where a woman talked about hearing five CIA agents um, talk about killing Kennedy needs to be dead in the next five years. And then she gets requested to go to some um, clinic and get a polio inoculation. And the doctor said before he injected her, you're going to forget everything. Everything, even the injection and then she didn't remember and i just go i don't even know what the hell to do with that because that's in the new release and i'm like this is your government that just put this out there and i go what does this even mean so but like i said i'm into like the mk ultra stuff i'm i talked to stephen kinzer who wrote poisoner in chief and all that and that amount of work and research that i mean you and other people do to kind of investigate a lot of these things that go on and I, I I wish the public was more receptive to it. You know, like I, I'm with you on a lot of this stuff, but a lot of people listening are like, oh my God, what's going on? They're shaving their head as they're doing. <laughs> yeah, well, right. Yeah. One of the one of the really interesting releases from military intelligence happened in the last years. And it gets us, and I know we're bringing a lot on board. We don't really want to get into 9 11. Absolutely not. And we don't want to get into UFOs either, but it is a UFO related story. Okay. Well, it's not about UFOs. It's about military experimental aircraft okay verified military experiment uh what happened was was that during the late 1940s when everyone knew the russians were developing in both a nuclear weapon and a nuclear assault program there was this program called the goliath high stratospheric balloon program and because the americans didn't have a u2 yet so what they would do apparently this is what the pentagon is telling us by the way is that they would have these really big huge balloons and they would fly and there, there would be one or two guys in the in a totally concealed uh, control compartment hanging from the balloon. And they go them up to like the stratosphere. I mean, 50, 60, 70,000 feet up. And very, very strong, high velocity currents. And they just zoom right over Russia, taking pictures of everything that they could. And then eventually they come back down. Now, the thing about them is these the Goliath balloons, or the balloons used for the Goliath project, when they were at a certain altitude, you could actually see them. 
But what they would look like were really small, round, silvery, shiny spheres. Something that when you looked at it, not knowing what it was, would look like, kind of like a saucer-like thing zipping around, making no noise, and no exhaust, right? because it was a balloon. So what the Air Force, uh, the Air Force Intelligence, which is behind so much of what we call the UFO phenomenon, uh, decided to do was get people to report it and then have them publish the conclusion that these people say they're seeing flying saucers, right? So in other words, they're seeing something that's real and they're describing it pretty accurately, but they don't know what it is they're describing because they didn't know about the Goliath project. And they didn't know about these balloons. They sent, we simply saw straight metal round silver things flying at a very high altitude really, really fast. It had to be something from outer space because what else could it be, right? So in a sense, they were putting the truth in plain view, but giving it a different name and therefore invalidating the accuracy of what was reported, even though what was being observed and being reported was actually pretty objectively correct. I just, my immediately thought process just went to cha-ching and I just thought military budgeting is going way up there to figure out what the fuck that is. <laughs> that's, that's what I, I mean, that's my first conclusion on so much of this stuff. There was so much like, I, Larry Hancock's a good friend of mine and he's done great work on the JFK and UFO. Say hello to Larry for me. I haven't spoken to him in ages, but yeah. Um, yeah, I can get a, probably a panel with all of us together in there as well too. Um, I, I'm surprised we talk so much about JFK. I'm going to call this a JFK episode for sure. But, dude, you're giving me enough of your time, Mr. Wilson, man. Is there is there a place where people can find your links? Um, uh, probably the best place to look me up is I'm sort of like a regular contributor to Punctum Books. And because they basically, have, uh, yeah, they publish quite a few of my things. And like, and then, so James Elroy is coming out with them. Um, so probably the best way to get hold of me is contact Punctum Books. You're going to have to repeat and, that again, but. Oh, sure, sure. Okay. It's Punctum. It is. Here we go. I'm sorry. Your mic cut out right when you oh, said Oh, that. sorry. Sorry. Yeah. We got to give you that free me, The best way to get hold of me is on Punctum Books. Contact Punctum Books. P-U-N-C-T-U-M space books. So it's Punctum Books, a small case. And uh, just say that they want, whoever wants to talk to me wants to send me a message or establish a link with me and my publishers will contact me and then I'll okay it if it's okay with me. I'm going to link all your links in the description. Seriously, Mr. Wilson, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, well, thanks very much for having me on board, Robbie. I always love talking deep state, don't you? <laughs> it's like, that's all I want to do now. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to link all your links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Pod.